what I wanted to do is you've been writing some excellent articles and also, as always, finding some great links to other articles about what's going on in Syria. And I know that you're also on the Brexit case and we have the, the, uh, the, the pound dropping like a rock, or it already has really. So what we in the America actually find to be very, very nice because now our dollar and the pound are closer to being equal. But nonetheless, I realize this is something of a disaster for, for Brits. At least if they want to go abroad, they aren't able to uh, capitalize on on their dollar. Uh, so what, what, you know, or their pound, what, what do you have to say about? We're, we're, we're looking at the latest stuff here. So uh, on the financial front, very interesting to see today. And I'm not sure if you, this news has reached you in the States yet is the, uh, the NatWest bank pulling the bank accounts of Russia today's London bureau. So that was literally this afternoon that news broke um, that the, Royal Bank of Scotland and National Westminster Bank have both uh, sent letters to Russia Today's London Bureau based at Millbank, uh, literally just straight across the River Thames from MI6 and just down the River Thames from MI5. They're kind of in between the two. And uh, so that is very interesting because the reason I say that is because over here, as hasn't happened in the US, those banks that were, were about to go bust back in 2008 have been bought by the government. And RBS is one of those, NatWest is one of those that's actually owned by the people. And so it's the People's Bank, run by the Treasury, run by the government, uh, the Conservative government, that has sent these letters to Rush Today, which is another state organisation. It's a state broadcaster of yes. the uh, uh, from Moscow. And so effectively, this is a sort of, you know what I, I would say, Kerry, it's a kind of privatization of diplomacy. Rather than going through the proper channels uh, and negotiating with the Russians through the embassy, etc., what they've done is they've used a effectively a kind of privatized version of the British monetary system, you know, the uh, or the uh, banks here in London, uh, to fire a shot across the bows, if you want, of the Russian state um, news gathering bureau in London and their channel is exclusive to Britain it goes out in Britain as well every evening and I think it's very one of the most fascinating things about the way the Russians manage these things is from a PR point of view is for a few hours they let us think good god this is could be the end for the Russia Today bureau in London which actually is producing some of the best uh, quality balanced news Amazingly, you know, we're getting uh, you know, another side of the story completely from this bureau, Absolutely. which the local media is not giving. Uh, and what they've done effectively is really embarrass the whole of the London media community. The people that own the transmitters, the printing presses right across London are being every day embarrassed by this tiny little operation, <laughs> just one, one little newsroom uh, and one outlet, which is showing so much that the London media is effectively taboo. So they let us get worried for a few hours, oh, gosh, this means that that bureau might be closed down. And then uh, uh, the uh, editor of the Russia Today Bureau then released something which obviously she must have been talking, I would imagine, to Moscow about, saying actually it's not going to affect what we do here at all. Uh, they've obviously got some other way of, of getting money backwards and forwards and paying their staff, paying the rent in the building they're in, etc. So they're not relying on this, uh, this state-owned bank, RBS, NatWest, at all. Uh, and it may even be that they've got other bank accounts ready to go. Uh, so this is a very, I think, very churlish and silly move by uh, the uh, City of London uh, to try and silence the criticism that there is of the propagandistic London media. I, I, I find it difficult now to find any media outlet in London, based in London, where you're getting balanced news, particularly on things like Syria. The one thing I would say uh, uh, about that particular conflict in, in Aleppo, which we're getting on the nightly news, you're probably getting exactly the same stuff over in the States, Kerry, is the uh, the last week there was a deal, a attempted deal done by uh, Assad's government, the legitimate government of Syria and the Russians, saying to the al Nusra Front in Aleppo, look, you can go out and you can take your guns with you. This was brokered by the UN, by the way, and take your guns with you. And you know what Al Nusra said? We said, we don't trust Assad. We're staying and they're going to fight and die here. Well, that effectively means that they're using the civilians in East Aleppo as human shields. Yes. And the, the NATO countries are backing them. Uh, contrast, right. of course, with what's going on in Iraq, 
in uh, in Mosul, which is where a lot of civilians have been allowed to leave uh, by the fighters there. So and so and uh, you know basically the whole situation is being I think run and managed from the west. I don't think that the the, the amateur fight, fighters in East Aleppo are really entirely their own masters. Otherwise, of course, they would take their guns and get out of there rather than get massacred by the Russians. And it's appalling that that, that this aspect of it, this br attempted deal to end the bloodshed in East Aleppo, the killing of civilians, has just not been reported in the London press or on the radio or in the newspapers here, hardly at all, Kerry. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you. That's uh, sort of a tour de force on your part. I have to say, I just want to, you know, take some steps back uh, to the Russia Today, the closure of uh, the bank accounts. Uh, this, you know, this is kind of a, what you might say is uh, an it, a, a bit interference with uh, press freedom. And so this is the kind of thing that uh, what's happening in both the United States and Britain in the Western uh, countries is that they no longer want to tell the truth at all to their people. And uh, it is true that Russia Today has been one of the few outlets that we get some, some straight stories from. Uh, I know one of our broadcasters, Scott Bennett, a whistleblower, has actually been on Russia Today a number of times. And, uh, and, and obviously, they, they are covering stories that matter. Uh, contrary to the British and American press, the British press is actually, um, I have to say, uh, with all due respect, actually appalling in their coverage. <laughs> um, just, I mean, blows my mind when I read the, the papers. And because I go back and forth to Britain nowadays, um, because my partner lives there. And so I have a free place to stay, obviously. Uh, and I have been able to read these headlines and the things they're putting out to the people there. And it's just extraordinary, the lies and the, the misdirects, uh, which are, are just amazing. And to get into Syria, absolutely using the Syrian people as human shields. This is what uh, that they are doing. This is what's going on. The U.S. that is backing Al Nusra and, in essence, what people know of as ISIS and ISIL, etc. These are considered to be uh, the terrorists, the 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 rebels in Syria, uh, from the point of view, of course, of the administration of Bashar and and uh, and so on. So so you've got Russia on one side and the U.S. My understanding is the U.S. is actually playing both sides. Uh, and when I say the U.S., of course, you cannot separate the U.S. and their actions from the U.K. These, these two countries are always hand in glove on most everything. So, uh, yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is an amazing situation that we have going on here. Uh, in terms of the overall look at things, uh, can you say anything more about what you think, you know, because we're having a lot of rumblings in my country. Uh, I'm getting a lot of information anyway, talking about, you know, the beginning of World War III and that this is all happening now and so on and so forth. And uh, someone is also rush. Uh, it looks like um, North Korea has been uh, firing off some, some, uh, some missiles, doing some so-called missile testing over South Korea and uh, threatening in that way. Have you heard these these things? Well, look, uh, I mean, there's a guy called Vincenzo Vinciguera. I'm not sure if you've ever come across him, but he was a fascist in Italy in the 1980s. He was part of the Operation Gladio. And uh, one of the most memorable quotes from him in, in the film of Alan Frankovich, who was the uh, Peruvian director that made this brilliant film for the BBC back in the early 1990s about Operation Gladio. One of the things that he filmed there, um, I think he went to LA Film School, was a really good filmmaker. Uh, and it was amazing that in those days, the BBC was so different that they would broadcast such a critical documentary about criminality going on within NATO. Uh, was His quote was, in 1945, World War II ended and World War III began. <laughs> so, in a way, this has kind of been going on for a long, long time, you know, with the deals that Nazis made with the Americans. And I think it's fair to say some of the high level 
British uh, people as well, particularly through Desmond Morton, who was Churchill's private secretary, a very interesting character that doesn't get anywhere near enough of a page he should have in history as a really notorious crook, uh, criminal, collaborator with the Nazis at the end, particularly of the Second World War. He was, he was doing something called uh, economic warfare. He was part of the British government's economic warfare office between the wars. He was an aide-de-camp to General Haig in the First World War. Uh, and notorious uh, Desmond Morton, uh, what he was doing uh, was effectively what's been going on since the Second World War, slowly but surely, it's been ramping up, uh, which is economic warfare. And of course, this thing with Russia today, uh, we've just heard about, is another example of that. They're using uh, banks to be a kind of political cudgel to, to bash people they don't like with. And effectively, the media in this country, as you were saying, is so controlled that as soon as somebody starts doing something, as the Rush Today crew have been doing in Milbank, which uh, tells the real story about what's really going on, it shows all of the rest of the media up. So that's why this economic warfare is something I don't think is enough well understood. I think you, you've got a basic thing happen. At the end of World War II, they gave up using tanks and they started using banks to take over. And you can take over just as effectively with a bank as you can with a tank. You're basically kicking, in fact, a tank makes much more of a mess. Uh, the banks can do it in a more, much more sort of surgical way by just cutting out the directors, the shareholders and the owners that you don't want and putting your own people in. And I think they've been breeding almost a, a kind of race of uh, ruthless directors business owners, etc. ever since the Second World War, to take on this, effectively, what is a kind of the Martin Borman network, uh, which you may have come across Borman, but he was very much survived the Second World War as Hitler's treasurer and uh, went to work kind of uh, in, in ensuring that the Nazi loot was put to good use. They had a lot of help from Morton uh, and other people in order to secrete this money away mainly uh, in South America. But uh, getting back to the, the whole issue of economic warfare, I think this is being done through things like sanctions. Uh, I mean, the Russians recently, I think it was Putin himself, said that the idea of sanctions is uh, is effectively uh, tantamount to a, a nuclear-type threat. So he's saying that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're building nuclear weapons and you're putting them near our borders, it's a similar thing to using sanctions to uh, stop our trade. To st you know, the idea of interfering with normal relations is similar to kind of ramping up to war. And I think you're right. I mean, we're seeing all the indications that a criminal elite here in the West, mainly centered around Britain and the United States, although, of course, very much embedded in places like Brussels as well. Uh, they are, I mean, through things, we've just got the anniversary of the Detroit scandal coming up, by the way. I think it's 25 years since since that, or maybe 20 years, the paedophile scandal in the heart of Brussels. Uh, you've got a criminal elite who are getting increasingly isolated. Uh, the other thing, of course, is Michael Tyler. I don't know if you've come across Michael, but he's done a brilliant blog here in Britain about the deaths of bankers since 2008. 75 bankers have apparently have committed suicide since... <laughs> If you yeah, can believe uh, that, since yeah, right. And, uh, well, uh, been suicided, yeah. I think, would be a little more accurate. Uh, but yes, fair but, enough. I mean, it's, you know, and it's, I would suggest that you've got what's happening is the honest bankers, any one with half kind of decency or a soul, is being uh, ejected from the system in a rather ruthless fashion. Of course, this tells uh, anyone else who's uh, a banker what's going to happen to them if they step out of line. So you know, you've got this criminal elite attitude where they just want to avoid. You know, avoid prosecution. They realise that their chickens could be coming home to roost, so they're taking effective steps to uh, ensconce themselves in this what is becoming increasingly feudal system. It's like we're going back to medieval times, not just in quality of public services as they get run down and run down here in Britain, but uh, also in our kind of political governance. I don't know what the situation is like in the states. Obviously, you've got your presidential elections coming on. Crikey, you know that's <laughs> horrific. And we've got immense media bias over here, as you do in the States, uh, against Donald Trump, where, you know, they don't even mention the fact that it, it looks, Seymour Hersh, for example, said that uh, Hillary Clinton was involved in the smuggling of sarin gas through the Benghazi embassy uh, in order to try and uh, uh, set up um, the Assad regime uh, two summers ago uh, with a sarin gas attack. 
So Clinton was involved in that. And then she was involved in basically getting the embassy bombed to cover her tracks. Now, we're told that that isn't important. What is important is that Donald Trump has made a few comments about, uh, you know, ladies, uh, women, <laughs> in a sexist manner. Now, you know, I know which one I would uh, prefer to run the United States. Uh, and I think that we've given this as a kind of deliberate attempt to trivialize the um, uh, the whole discussion. We haven't got any problems yes. done at all here. Yes, uh, the lowest uh, common denominator is what we're really talking about. When we're talking about the election, we're talking about going for personality issues rather than the real issues that are at hand and how these people would deal with them. Uh, the, you know, Clinton's record is, is out there. It's clearly known. And uh, the only trouble with Trump is that who he's really working with is not commonly discussed. And this is a, a big problem. So whereas I can certainly say that he is, uh, he's like the, the wild card in the deck. And uh, it, it's clear. I mean, Camelot was told, you must understand, over uh, six years ago, that Hillary would run in 2016 at a time when it sounded impossible that this would happen, but that would run in 2016 and she would win. That was their plan. Okay. Their meaning the Illuminati, this uh, group that involves uh, MJ 12, what we know of as MJ 12, this also called committee of the majority. Uh, you know, it's gone, goes by Scion, it goes by a lot of different names. Um, you know, I, I do want to say though, that there is, it's all spin in the mainstream media and even some of the alternative media, as you can appreciate, it's all about how they spin this information and they leave what they leave out is often much more important than what they put in to these. Well, they've, uh, they've left out Benghazi and they've left out all the WikiLeaks uh, email uh, revelations sure. about Clinton too. So, you know, you've got the two uh, most important in terms of, geopolitics and in terms of someone's suitability to do the job, uh, you know, given that most of the candidates for all these top political positions are pretty hopeless. Absolutely. I think you'd probably agree, wouldn't you? you know, well, I, uh, I think uh, I think thinking that even the election is over someone who's going to have control, uh, it's not the people you're electing, it's the people behind them that have the control. And, uh, and this is the misnomer. And so when you concentrate on personality, uh, you're missing the point entirely. And uh, and so this petty stuff about women and whether Trump likes women or hates women or whatever the hell, who cares? You know, um, in the end, it's it's not about that. I mean, he if he gets into office, he's going to be a puppet. I'm sorry to say. And this was decided back in in the coup that happened in America with uh, Kennedy. And uh, ever since then, it is clear that we have a cabal in place. Uh, it's certainly Hillary is is run by Bush. There's no doubt about it. And the Bush, what we call the Bush cabal. Uh, and you can see how England is, again, hand in glove with America. They're keeping the press, uh, you know, anti-Trump uh, because he, he again, is coming from uh, what is, in essence, probably a split at the top, a split that involves two completely uh, nefarious and diabolical organizations um, and there is some uh, some issue to do with the Scottish right that that is uh, behind Trump. And um, and that's a very interesting Illuminati um, quasi religious uh, black dark magician, uh, you know, Vatican, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot going on there that's not being revealed. Um, I do think it's interesting that North Korea, I'm looking at RT. You're saying the bank account was just frozen. Uh, I am looking at an RT headline just recently. North Korea threatens U.S. with preemptive nuke st uh, strike and promises more tests, according to. And there's this picture of this test. And uh, Japan is, is quite worried about what's going on, apparently. Well, look, certainly is, the Russians are taking this seriously, Kerry. They yes. did their exercise last week, which was uh, 10 days ago or so, which was 40 million people involved in uh, an exercise. That's I would true. like to know what our governments are doing to prepare us yeah. for some kind of uh, nuclear exchange. Uh, you know, but certainly back in the 1960s and 70s, there was a very uh, sort of sensible kind of policy to say, well, look, you know, there, we've got bunkers, we've got shelters, this kind of thing, uh, and we've got evacuation plans. Nowadays, they just seem to just want to ignore it and ignore us 
you know, so we're just going to be kind of collateral damage in this nuclear exchange, which well, they think they can win. I can tell you that, uh, you know, I, it was reported to me that they did scramble uh, some jets and there were some air raid sirens. I don't know if it was a test or not in San Diego uh, just a, a few nights ago. That's quite interesting along these lines. Uh, I can tell you that the military situation is being beefed up along the West Coast because that's where I live. Um, this Operation Gladio, though, I just wanted to get back there really quickly, and thank you for mentioning that, uh, as the arm of NATO. A um, lot of people don't know, uh, but perhaps have seen my many interviews with Ole Domagard, who is an investigator of false flags and assassinations. And he talks again and again about how Operation Gladio is basically orchestrating these false flags, that the individuals from, who work for that organization are often the same individuals again and again seen on the streets and, and photographed, et cetera, as, and having roles to play within these, uh, these false flags, including the ones in Paris, et cetera, and, um, and, and Germany, I'm sure, recently, et cetera. So this is, uh, this is a very diabolical organization that is an arm of the Illuminati, that is constantly in play. And we have other uh, testimony in this regard uh, as well. And I can say that the work of Ole Domagard in this is, is to be noted. So um, in- well, it's also, I mean, let's be fair here. Also civil evidence has done quite a lot of work on just, just explaining this kind of sure. radio too, which is the, rather than the Soviet union being the threat, you've got the Islamists being the threat supposedly in the modern era. Uh, and, and it's, I mean, one of the most shocking examples of uh, really does look as if this is an Operation Gladio style of um, occurrence is all the panic that there was last week in Germany over some apparent plot, uh, some explosives apparently found in somebody's uh, flat apartment. Uh, and this person is then arrested, blah, 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 big fuss about it. It's all over the German news for several days. And then lo and behold, this uh, chap then commits suicide in, uh, in jail. Now, I would oh, suggest God. to you, Henry, we're moving into Gestapo territory here. Yes. And for a long time, the Germans have managed to sort of uh, manoeuvre themselves to say, well, of course, nothing like that could ever happen here again. We are the sensible people of Europe, blah, oh, blah. But I can tell you, I mean, for example, they've been supplying these free Dolphin-class submarines to uh, Israel, which can be used to launch cruise missiles, nuclear cruise missiles, of course, as well, if they're uh, controlled by the Israelis. Uh, they've been giving them free as reparations from the Second World War to the Israelis. They've also got their own drone program, um, and that's been they've been trying to keep that very quiet. They've also changed the law in Germany so that German troops now can operate outside German soil. They're not, not just defensive. They can start going around. Of course, they've been in Afghanistan, etc., um, doing rituals with bones. I can remember that little story from a few years ago, which didn't get much coverage in the press here. Uh, and also, they, they're, they're allowing the uh, United States to use uh, their, their uh, ba- I can't remember the name of the base, there's a big base in, uh, in Rammstein, that's right, in Germany, which the intercept of Exposed is one of the key points in the whole international drone program. So if the Germans wanted to stop this, war, these war crimes, these drone assassinations going on, they could do it just at the click of a switch and say to the Americans, no, you can't do that anymore. It's on German soil. Uh, so the Germans have actually been quietly um, participating in this kind of NATO war on terror, uh, but they've been actually very clever in hiding the amount they've been participating. But this thing last week, to me, it really struck me as uh, incredible that somebody uh, could be considered, even though they were on so-called suicide watch, to have hanged themselves in their own cell after there having been really no evidence presented that, that right. this person was really behind any kind of terrorism at all. But this happens the- every time. They, every single time, the so-called perpetrator, who is always seen to be a lone gunman, uh, is it ends up dead. Uh, one way or another, so they can never testify, can never turn on their masters, so to speak, and uh, reveal the mind control element, the Manchurian candidate side of things. Um, I do want to say that there is a lot of posturing going on right now, and I think that the closure of the Russia Today bank accounts is one of those sort of posing uh, places where where you've got... um, You've got Korea, 
you've got the United States posturing uh, militarily, of course, and doing things very nefariously behind the scenes, uh, saying they're going to have, you know, a, a, an efforts at peace in Syria and then going and bombing, uh, you, you know, the uh, the troops at the same time that they're they're claiming they're going to have a ceasefire. Uh, we've got Russian uh, Russian vessels that are being uh, shown to be sailing for the Mediterranean. We've got uh, all kinds of demonstrations of hardware. It's it is you know in other words one this reminds me of one of our whistleblowers uh, way back when this is back in 2006 who who basically told us that China and the U.S. were planning to have a war in the future and that this is something they work on together. So this is something that a lot of people don't understand that the mm-hmm. Russia and the U.S. are actually working on this together. Why would they do that? Because in China or Russia? Just a minute. China or Russia? Well, what I'm using this example is both Russia, China, and these countries behind the scenes are in essence playing a game board. And what their real objective is to do is to eliminate populations, to put their young men who are lounging around the streets, especially a lot of young Arab men that have no jobs, nothing else to do to be recruited into armies, et cetera, and then to be used as cannon fodder. And uh, young men in both the United States and uh, Britain and other places to be able to demonstrate their mm-hmm. hardware, to yeah. use this uh, gun running and, the, and all of this. This is a game being played on the surface well, I, of the planet. I agree with a lot of what you've said. All I would say is from my, my, my assessment of this is, yes, you're right, with regards to China and uh, the U.S., You've got a kind of U.S. empire and NATO uh, and on the one hand and China on the other side. And I would point to the fact that you've got, of course, you've got the triads in China. You've got the similar kind of secret societies in um, in the U.S. through Freemasonry. And I don't know how much you looked into the triads, but their recognition signs, secret recognition signs, uh, occult recognition signs are exactly the same as the Freemasons. So yes, you're dealing with absolutely. Of, you know, we're dealing with the same kind of, uh, well, effectively, that go, this goes back to witchcraft, if you look into it. Right. Uh, you've got similar secret societies, covens, and people who are basically working for their own interests in these covens against the rest of us. You know, you do have uh, in the Yakuza societies, the triads, a similar thing to masonry. So that could possibly be true, that they're working well against the other, and they maybe they have been doing this for centuries. But I, I, don't, I don't agree with the Russians. Looking at the way Russia works, and having visited Russia a couple of years ago, I just feel, my feeling is that the Russians really are a kind of uh, wild card in this, that they may go with uh, one side, they may, they're trying their best to get on with the United States, because they can see that in Europe and the US, there's much more uh, uh, freedom of speech, for example, and China is actually very, you know, you criticise the government in China, you can easily end up in jail. That's not the situation in the US or in Britain, or most of Europe, of course, uh, that that's, that's allowed, that's encouraged. And uh, uh, well, it appears to be, although although we have evidence that whistleblowers are still being killed, um, and certainly even our politicians were threatening to kill Snowden, saying that he should be shot, he should be killed, uh, even yeah. publicly. Yeah. I mean, there is uh, this this idea, though, that these major powers are behind the scenes working to orchestrate some, at least some of this. Now, there may be some acrimonious you know, issues between various uh, militaries, for example. So it kind of depends on what level of the pyramid you're really talking. But I, I can say that um, one thing that Jordan Maxwell always says, it's it's one bird with two wings. And the two wings are, uh, in essence, communism on one side and uh, democracy on the other, or the U.S. on one side, symbolized by the Western com- countries and Russia on the other, but it's one bird at the top. It is also important to realize that Russia and the United States do work together in the secret space program and have for many, many years. And uh, China is the odd person out. Now, there I don't know if you know about that, what is called the Hinnock Prophecies by Billy Meyer, uh, but his in his dealings with what he calls the Nordics, that he was dealing with. Uh, and some people discount that as being untrue. But if you look into what's called the Hennock prophecies, which are printed on the internet, it is very interesting to see that they do appear to be coming true. They were written years ago. And one of the things they talk about is this battle over 
uh, Iran and Syria, and that eventually what will happen is that the U.S. and Russia, this is just according to that prophecy, it hasn't quite happened yet, but pay attention because it says that China will seem to be brought into this conflict, that Russia and the U.S. will be standing off, and initially that Russia and China will seem to be more aligned with Iran and on and that side, but eventually that Russia will rejoin uh, the U.S. and turn against China, and that ultimately the end game here is again a war with China. So it is interesting, you know, the stage we're at here, the posturing going on, and this is uh, something to watch, of course. Look, you talking about posturing really triggers off, fires off the synapses here because it's quite clear that Deutsche Bank have been kind of posturing using their threat of uh, going under as a way of uh, trying to reduce the fines in the United States. So I don't know just how dangerous it really was there that they might have gone down. But look, look at the way that Putin came to power. That's another way, good way, I think, of assessing to what extent the Russians are involved in this kind of you know, the paint, you're painting this picture of this kind of big international conspiracy, which I mean, certainly may well be some truth to it. But Putin's rise to power was uh, really through, I think, uh, 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 a legitimate sort of tricking of the people who thought they were going to be running Russia and taking over Russia. That is to say, the, uh, you know, the oligarchs of the time. Right. Uh, and he managed, he managed to kind of, I think, outplay them at chess in order to, for the FSB and some of the Secret Service people in Russia to say, no, we're not having this oligarchy running this country. It's going to be much more democratic. And, of course, he, they have problems over at Russia today. For example, you will never see Russia today uh, talking about the Communist Party. They never talk about it. <laughs> of course Even not. The, major, the main opposition party in Russia, it's kind of frozen out. So let's not... You know, ignore yes. the fact that RT is biased too in favour of Putin. Yes, but, yes. But, you know, there, there are positive sides to uh, the way Putin's running things. He's trying to play a very clever game, I think, being quite uh, positive towards the um, uh, US, you know. Yes, uh, I, I mean, I, I think he is. He comes out as the level-headed one. Uh, I think that that's what a lot of people would would see about Putin at this time, that he is actually holding his, you know, um, sort of, grandstanding and all of that he's not uh he's doing something playing a very intelligent game so to speak and uh and that's evident uh i can't say exactly what his his dealings are uh, obviously we're 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 looking at the same uh mirror image here that all of us and and not being able to see quite behind the scenes what is really going on with these what are so-called leaders and then their pressure groups, the people that are behind the scenes uh, sort of pulling the strings and, and getting these leaders to do what they want. But he remember, does appear to also, be operating a lot uh, remember, sort of on his own. been the assault by the West, if you want, really since Napoleonic times. And so I think that they were... Uh, they're kind of ready for the sort of games that the, the Europeans and the Americans are trying to play uh, yes. in trying to push them back and push them back. Uh, also, uh, there does seem to be genuine, genuine support for Putin within Russia. Certainly when I was in Moscow, it was like, you know, I felt like being in Soho in the 60s. You know, our young people, Kerry, are so positive. They feel like, you know, you can see the youngsters feel like the world is their oyster. Things are getting better in Russia. Job opportunities are opening up for young people. Uh, That's marvelous. The old places which have been derelict for years are being restored, being looked after. Uh, the roads are being kind of re and lines put on them, this kind of thing, the main motorways, that sort of thing. And and you get this sense that whatever Putin's doing, whether he's a good guy, bad guy, Illuminati or not, he's a very good manager and he's slowly getting the country back onto its feet again. One of the most important things, of course, he's been doing is what any sensible politician does, which none of our Western ones do, which is to wrest back control of the financial system from a bunch of, uh, you know, private privateers, you know, privatisers. The private sector want to use money for their own personal political benefit, as we've seen with RBS, you know, closing down these Russian media bank accounts today so you know, right. uh, you know actually I wanted to talk about Deutsche Bank because uh, 
that I was told uh, by a back channel person uh, that uh, when Deutsche Bank goes under, that that's the signal of, of the demise of the, you know, what is in essence going to be this takedown of the monetary system. You know, I totally agree. It's, it's the, the major flagship private Western European bank. Uh, what they've done is they've taken over from the old central banks like the Bundesbank and the Bank of England. Now the big private banks. It was like based Asia, on Nazi Asia. gold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's 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 basically that bank. So now I don't know if, uh, as you said, they're being rescued by uh, if, if, if some kind of uh, back channel, uh, you know, games are going to rescue them. Again, it, it is very troubling, though, I have to say. And obviously, I'm coming from a different direction than, than maybe some of the people that interview you, Tony. But I am told that a lot of what is going on and what appears to be a war uh, on the surface here for oil and, and things like that is a complete, um, a, a complete facade. And that what's really going on is is a battle, first of all, to get to, as I was saying before, uh, you know, to 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 kill a lot of people, to decimate the, the infrastructure of the country. This is a this is something that they did the same thing with Iraq. In essence, they want to put in a different uh, ruler. But the first they want to take down the entire infrastructure. So they're destroying Aleppo, uh, you know, what is probably a beautiful ancient city. Uh, is basically reduced to rubble. And the people, of course, are the collateral damage. This is always the case. So uh, definitely that is going on. Um, look, if they really wanted to take over that country in one fell swoop, uh, with the very high-tech weaponry they have at their disposal, they could, first of all, they could kill Bashar in a, in a heartbeat, sending a, what is, in essence, a scalar weapon pulse, uh, they can also do it with a remote viewer. Remote viewers can kill people, in case you don't know, um, with their minds. So there would be no evidence um, of this. In other well, words, look- they are prolonging this this takedown of the country on purpose so that they can wrap in the demonstrations of their weapons of war that are actually, a lot of them, even antiques as we speak, that just need to be used and and gotten rid of. They're also uh, getting rid of a lot of troops. Uh, they're they're wrapping the entire world up in this kind of scenario that involves uh, what what appears to be immigration that then can destabilize Europe and destabilize Britain. And Britain has certainly been uh, vulnerable to this situation. Um, in other words, what I'm trying to paint here is a picture that involves a lot of an agenda that is is long term that involves a lot of pieces that are being put in place. So people that just focus on the moment of yeah. what's going on on just the ground in Aleppo are going to miss the bigger picture here. No, I, I think you might well be right. Certainly my experience of the ruling class here in Britain, you know, the sort of London elite, if you want, is that for ch- chatting to their children who are a lot more freer about talking about what their parents say than their parents probably would be, uh, is that they believe that uh, the human race needs to be culled every once in a while and the wars are healthy and necessary. You know, this is their uh, attitude of people who are quite clearly above the law. You know, they're not really interested in uh, whether they're going to be touched by the law. Uh, as we've seen in the uh, child sexual abuse scandal post Jimmy Savile, it's quite clear that for decades here in Britain, if you're well connected, if your uh, so-called important people are involved, like MPs, senior police officers, etc., are your friends, then they're going to make sure that you don't get prosecuted for these kinds of offences. And that's one of the reasons why we've got this uh, child sex abuse scandal has been uh, brewing up here for such a long time. So I think you've got a mindset there, which is, well, we are totally invulnerable. We have as much money as we want. And the justice system is only for the little people, not for us. And, you know, in a way, this was bound to cause problems down the line because these people will have to take measures in order to gain control of the criminal justice system to get a great deal of influence in um, uh, in, in particularly in the press because of course the press in a way like the BBC World Service is a kind of a world's last court of appeal if you've tried everything uh, then you know in the old days I mean we're talking about 30 40 years ago you used to be able to go to places like the World Service and you'd get a hearing and maybe something would happen but nowadays of course the media has been much more owned and controlled by the uh, you know the bad guys and you know in a way I think it's it, you can look at the three main monotheistic religions where all this 
fighting has been going on in the Middle East, uh, Judaism, Christianity, uh, and Islam, and each one of them has got its kind of parasitic heresy attaching itself to it, almost like a kind of demon, you know, attaching itself to that honest, righteous faith, which is, you know, it just wants to do good, wants to see good in the world, uh, as all those three faiths are very, very positive. They're all about being nice to people, good to people, love your neighbor, all that kind of thing. And these heresies effectively, where well, you've got Zionism attaching itself to Judaism uh, and dragging that down, at least attempting to, you know, if anyone will believe it. Uh, and then you've also got Christian Zionism with Christianity, uh, this complete heresy, the idea that Netanyahu is some kind of God, God's gift to mankind, you know. Uh, and uh, and then with uh, Islam, you've got this Wahhabism, uh, which is, was created after the Second World War, really, by um, uh, at least it was massively overfunded by when the creation of Saudi Arabia and the idea that loads of this oil money could be channeled into schools to teach people this Islamic heresy. So there's been a very much a focus on the Middle East and doing all these. Well, whether uh, you call it Islamic he heresy or whether you call it just educate the people, I mean, there there are mixed. Uh, you know, you can get into that whole uh, it's, Islamic it's thing of the core faith. Because the core faith in all those three faiths is good. There what is. They've, they've taken there is, the, the But there's also <laughs> yes. Uh, Definitely a complete, uh, you know, a breakdown in, in, in what was, in essence, religions. But I have to say most religions are control-based uh, anyway to control humans, well, look, uh, from on. my I, point it, of view. Just a minute, Gary, because things, sentiments like love thy neighbor are positive, you know. And, yes. you know, Jesus' message of, of, of love your enemy, actually, that's what we need. That's exactly the kind right. of thing we need people to be doing Listen, around the world in order to get I, on to get. No one would argue with that. Listen, I want to ask you, I, I just spotted a, a, a message here on the BBC saying that WikiLeaks, uh, that uh, they have shut down internet access for Julian Assange. There was some some uh, rumors going around that he might have even been killed and, and, and so on just recently. But uh, apparently this is just coming out on the BBC today, uh, just an hour ago. They're quite clearly ramping this up, aren't they, right now? What's happened is the Russians, I think uh, the Russians are being honest in the way they're doing. They're actually effectively a kind of uh, de facto United Nations. They're doing the job the UN should be doing, have blocked the US-British NATO alliance in Syria quite effectively. And these guys are mad. They're getting crazy. They're getting annoyed. And so they're starting to thrash out, lash out, and do little other things they can to get back at, uh, the Russians or get back at their enemies, people that they don't like, uh, because they're annoyed. And this is, you, you're kind of dealing with a, in a way, a kind of a, a, a tiger that's been painted into a corner. I mean, that's mixing metaphors, but, you know, they're starting to get a little bit uh, unstable and starting to show their hand as being, you know, the idea of the Assange is, look, Julian Assange is the most important, the most impressive, radical publisher on the planet and he is publishing some amazing stuff as people are going to him from all over the world leaking material to Assange you know I'm not you know he's not a guru or anything but he's a very very good investigative journalist and that's why they hate that stuff uh, they want to keep us dumbed down and Julian Assange is on a completely the opposite mission which is why they're so afraid of him well uh, I, I'm not so sure about that there is some evidence that uh, the Mossad uh, are sheltering Assange and uh, I, I don't necessarily know how true that is but I have had reports to this well, effect. Sure. a lot of the uh, want to get close to him that's yeah, yeah I can say uh, let me just say that this information about his internet seems to be wrapped around Ecuador they're blaming Ecuador for shutting down a uh, uh, WikiLeaks says Ecuador has shut down internet access for its founder, Julian Assange. So what, uh, the, uh, meaning the Ecuadorian embassy has done this, but the question would be who got the Ecuadorian embassy to, mm. to do act in this way. And it seems to be yeah. uh, surrounding Hillary's emails and the recent release of. Well, this uh, will be a diplomatic threat by the U S to Ecuador, which probably hasn't yes, come out. Yes, very possible. Uh, so this is this is now just breaking news and, and very interesting. Uh, what's in the leaked emails and what more was about to come out is the question. Um, I, I would say so. This is this is again very interesting. Um, you know, I do want to say that 
Hillary's leaked emails, I, I kind of have a different point of view on this. And I, I just wanted to run this by you and see where you're at. Um, basically, the notion that that, you know, there are a lot of uh, top legislatures, uh, top people that are in government that are having uh, probably places where they're doing secret emails, et cetera. Look, we know we're all under surveillance. Uh, these lead, so-called leaders are no exception. They are making uh, an example of this, of her her, her sort of dealings. Uh, in, in my understanding, she is basically very involved in the cabal, et cetera. So this, this uh, access to her emails also is somewhat of a goldmine for... Um, for the people on the surface, uh, sort of mainstream media, but it is not a surprise to someone like myself and other people that do investigative work, knowing that she's been working behind the scenes and been involved in uh, many things that are being orchestrated by the United States government uh, around the world. And so this access is also slightly misleading, I want to say, because the bottom line is what is her motivation for, for being involved in these things? You have to look beyond the incidents. In other words, we're looking at Benghazi and Benghazi in my view has not even been completely um, exposed as to what was really going on there. Certainly we know that our ambassador was killed. Uh, I do know that some gun running was going on there that, uh, that the uh, Mossad was very involved in and uh, that that embassy was used, used in that way as well. You're talking about sarin gas coming to the surface. Well, that may more. also, yeah. yeah, that may also be just the tip of the iceberg as to what was going on. And that's only one embassy in a country that was then again de destabilized. Gaddafi, again, being a ruler that went off, that was put in place by the U.S., went off the reservation, then was taken out just like Saddam Hussein, we have a pattern going on here. And, uh, and, and you've got a, a situation in Syria where they may want access to what is in essence the Stargates. Uh, this, I would posit, is a whole different ballgame than what is being put in the media. A lot of this and the reasons for actions is distraction. So, um, you know, I'm just throwing that out. This is a much bigger game than what most people want to deal with. But what happens is why on the same day are we hearing news about Julian Assange losing his access to media and at the same time uh, the, the pulling of the bank accounts, which supposedly would, in theory, cripple um, RT, another news outlet in Britain. What is going on behind the scenes in Britain that is actually cracking down on freedom of the press right now? What's about to happen to where they want to try to interfere? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? You're right. Uh, there's been a real ramping up of, uh, of pressure since the, uh, uh, the, it became pretty clear that the Russians are, are going to back uh, Assad to such an extent that there really is nothing. That, I mean, you know, we had this crazy situation, didn't we? Uh, I mean, I was just reading about this a few weeks ago where you've got British special forces inside Syria training uh, the so-called moderate rebels who are indistinguishable in many cases from our Nusra uh, and the Russians basically phoning up the Brits and saying, look, we're about to bomb you guys. So the Brits jump in their jeeps and zoom off to leave the uh, locals they've just been training. Many of them, of course, are not actually from Syria. They're from other parts of the world. They're you know, sure. part of our Nusra uh, to their fate and the Russians then bombing them from the air. So you've got a farcical situation going on in Syria and it's become pretty clear that, 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 that Britain, America, etc., have lost their little game with ISIS. The idea that they can have, pretend that they're going in there to try and stop these Islamists has been completely checkmated by the Russians. And so they're looking now for more options. They always seem to want to move this whole thing forward. It'd be nice if they could just go home to their ranches or whatever and, uh, I don't know, go for a swim, chill out or whatever. Uh, but they don't want to do that. They've got to keep advancing the whole time, it seems. And what's going on here in the UK, which was your, your particular point, was I think we're dealing with a, a fairly new government uh, and what's happening is that the oligarchy is pushing this government as they've done today. They've really, this is an attack on our, uh, our, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Philip Hammond, 
the the idea that he has got no say in, as to whether a Russian state organisation ha has or doesn't have a bank account in London is a ridiculous. Of course, he should be he should be stepping in. He should be making statements, etc. And yet, his boss Theresa May has said, as I noticed on Zero Hedge earlier, uh, has said that um, uh, this has got nothing to do with us. Well, of course, it does. And they <laughs> just want to uh, they they just want to shrug this kind of thing off. Uh, they're crazy. I mean, they're not. They don't expect, honestly, intelligent British people to believe that this is no concern of the British state, whether or not the Russian broadcaster is or is not allowed to operate in London. Uh, on the wider question, we're dealing with uh, a whole series of fraudulent uh, elections uh, in 2015, last year, which brought the Conservatives to power. Uh, 31 different members of Parliament here, Conservative members of Parliament. Uh, there has been uh, uh, submissions made to the police to show that their uh, election expenses were fraudulent. In other words, they were they spent too much, usually by quite a large degree, on that election. Therefore, by law, there should be a recount. Uh, the election is void and they have to have another election. Now, that wipes out the Conservative majority quite easily. If they were to actually go through those by-elections and have the new MPs elected, Conservatives don't have a majority anymore and so they can't be in, in the government so the, you've got a big political sort of thing boiling under the surface there where it's really just down to the individual chief constables across the, across the country as to whether they want to pursue those inquiries or not and it looks as if they're deciding well we're just going to kick this into the long grass and forget about it you know so that shows you how uh, fragile effectively the credibility of the current government is uh, you know, without David Cameron. Well, let's talk about Theresa May uh, a moment and, and, and what is actually going on with her uh, because there are some very strange uh, sort of machinations going on at this moment and also to do with Brexit. Uh, do you have any thoughts about all of that? Yeah, well, look, I mean, look, her track record is appalling. Her track record is uh, as Home Secretary under Cameron. Uh, it, she decimated our prisons and our police forces there's something like 15% of police officers were lost under her watch. So that's just basically, you know, most through natural ways, she's not recruiting new police officers. So she's done quite a lot in order to erode the rule of law in Britain. And yet nobody really seems to be uh, uh, calling her account to account for it. The other thing is in the prisons. Now, Kerry, the prisons in Britain are in a terrible, terrible state. We just had another report last week. Uh, about the number of suicides in prisons, uh, the number of violent assaults in prisons, because the it, prison officers simply there's not enough around in order to keep order within the prisons. Uh, and this, to me, I'm afraid, cynical of me, I'm saying, well, actually, this is just about the rundown of the government, the rundown of public services uh, in our um, in the individual local authorities, like here in Bristol, a massive uh, a rundown in things like basic care for the elderly and money for social services, this sort of thing. It's all just draining away. Absolutely. So, I, well, yeah. I've been to Britain and I've she's, seen this. Um, on, it is appalling the number of poor on the streets in Britain, actually. Uh, and, and, and the poverty is, is very evident even out, um, you know, on the outskirts of London, uh, to say nothing of, of, of inner London, it, the part that is not where the big city, you know, sort of, the, the lovely part of London. Uh, so, you know, this is what we're talking about. Uh, there is a lot of erosion. I understand that people are simply not going out as much in, in London. I know that this is also yeah. happening. No, it seems that media are not reporting this, but we're seeing restaurants, even in the West Coast here in America, starting to cut corners uh, rather strenuously, indicating the uh, what is in essence... Um, you know, a crisis that we're having. Uh, well, look, you know, I, I just, because we have to end, end soon, but I'd like to end on something a bit positive, really. One thing is this wonderful quote by Donald Trump, which has been going around here the last few days. I don't know if it's probably, we're probably a week behind you here, uh, saying <laughs> that only explosives could have brought down the World Trade Center on 9-11. This is a really, actually, because 9-11 is such a key part of our kind of global international relations policy is an important thing for Donald Trump to have said. And it's great that he said it. Ex only even, even if he's, even if he's wrong the <laughs> on the, on the, on the level of uh, we're, we're really talking about uh, basically um, what is in essence a uh, scalar weapon and mini nukes, et cetera. So it's a misdirect in a certain sense, but I appreciate I mean, it's, the it's sentiment. The right direction. 
it's a step in the right direction, yes. Kerry. Yes, I get think, it. I, we've I, got to kind of, I think, grab <laughs> onto these little bits of positivity and say, wow, well done. <laughs> That. You know, it's important that we're actually going, you know, there's a lot of criticism of people for being a little bit half-hearted about these things. That's fine, of course, but at least he's heading in the better direction than Hillary, who doesn't seem to care about any of that. The other thing is I've heard some quite good news from uh, the Canadian 9-11 truth professor, Anthony Hall, uh, who was sacked uh, just, I think, about uh, 10 days ago from his, his uh, university in, uh, in uh, Alberta, in Canada, Lethbridge University. Anthony Hall has written an absolutely brilliant book, which I have no hesitation in recommending to all your viewers and listeners, and that is uh, a book called Earth Into Property, and it's all about the uh, colonization of the United States by mostly by the Bristolians, of course, where I'm speaking to you from, John Cabot and his crew, and then, of course, the Plymouth Brethren, etc. after that. The way that the British, mainly the British, uh, went into the United States and started this conversion of our god-given planet you know the free gift to mankind this wonderful earth that is the united states was commodified and privatized by the british earth into properties his book but the good news is uh, there's a legal threat a legal challenge now against the um uh, university that sacked him and anthony hall's actually i think been one of the most powerful and effective advocates for 9-11 truth and he's making the connection effectively that the war on terror is just a kind of extension of the colonial holocaust the indian wars you know uh, from hundreds of years ago the hundred million or so native americans that were killed today there's a similar kind of thing going on it's called the war on terror yeah, very, very, very true. Uh, well, I mean, if you want to end on a positive note, what I would say is what you have to look at is the consciousness and the fact that people are waking up all over the world. And Camelot is in a position to know this because we get emails constantly from people who are watching our broadcasts as well as the broadcasts all over YouTube in which people are investigating to find out the real truth of what's going on in their neighborhoods and around the world and with these situations. So if you look hard enough, you can find people that are investigating the truth about anything that goes out there and what's really going on behind the scenes. This is the positive note that all people want to hear. Um, this is the real positive, not just some fake feel good, uh, you know, type of, of situation. So I do appreciate though the energy and, and the thought that you have about all of this and certainly individuals will have some positive developments in their own lives that are, are, are lovely. And, you know, we do have, let me just say, we do have positive ETs working behind the scenes on our behalf as, as well. So, um, you know, I, I'm an, I'm actually an incurable optimist when, when all is said and done, I do think getting the truth out though, shouldn't inhibit you being optimistic. Yeah. Have um, you heard of the term pro <laughs> Yeah, there there you go. There you go. You see, and I think actually there are some people, you know, certainly uh, people in secret services, people in the military, people who are in powerful positions around the world behind the scenes who are actually decent people and they're working on our behalf. Say, for example, there's some kind of corruption going on. They'll shred it. They'll make sure it disappears and never comes to court, that kind of thing. But anyhow, thanks ever so much for inviting me on again, Kerry. Lovely to speak to you. And it's nice, I think, the way we have a bit of a, you know, we're both coming from different perspectives, but both pulling in the same direction. Absolutely. Well, it's lovely to have you on again, Tony. And, you know, let's do this again, you know, because people would love to hear from you. We love getting your reports. We love, you know, your perspective and being in Britain and, and do, being the wonderful investigator who also has a background in history. That's what I really relish in talking to you because you can always bring those, you know, those historical uh, pieces of information in to match what's going on today and to give mm -hmm. that some perspective. I always feel a little bit guilty as an English person because of the English Civil War. You know, this was one of the <laughs> beginnings of capitalism, you know, where the old city-state merchants took over an entire country and they started messing the world up with their empire. But anyhow, There you go. Uh, well, um, I appreciate that. If you look on our show, uh, uh, which is a current affairs program on the radio here in Bristol every Friday, uh, I don't know what the time will be over there, but it's 5 till 7 UK time. It's at the uh, website this week .org.uk and you can download the podcast, listen to them in your car, wherever you happen to be, and uh, you'll find that we have a bit of fun on the radio too, Kerry. 
Excellent. Yes, absolutely. Well, there are good journalists everywhere in, in spite of all the ones that are actually, you know, paid shrills. So, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind. All the best. Cheerio. All right. Take care. Thanks, Thanks so much for showing up at the last minute there. Yeah, sorry about that. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, that was uh, lovely to uh, to actually get Tony on the air here. And I hope all of you enjoyed that as much as I did. He's extremely knowledgeable and I love, you know, I like to challenge him. I like to give him uh, sort of a different perspective and, and see what he does, does with it. I think it's, it's worth listening to. And he's, he's extremely knowledgeable and, and has great information. So the world stage that we're dealing with is extremely active. Uh, if you heard a lot of what I was talking about earlier, I hope you enjoyed that as well. As I say, please do send any, uh, if, if anyone is, is able to gather any questions that came for Mark Richards specifically in the chat. Uh, we are still looking for donations because I'm going there on Friday. It does cost me money when I have to travel and uh, pay, you know, uh, room and board and things like this and so on. And um, as always, uh, it's great that everyone is watching and, and people are waking up and thinking uh, with discernment about what's really going on here. It's so important not just to just take the surface information, but to dig deep and to do your own homework and to think for yourself and not just fall for the easy targets here. Uh, a lot of what's going on on planet Earth is being orchestrated and we are pushing back now. The more awake you are, the more you can push back. So that's what it's all about. So thanks again for watching. And I will have a couple shows later this week that I will announce soon. So stay tuned to my Twitter and to ProjectCamelotPortal.com for more information. So have a great day and thanks for listening and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.